very good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, afternoon here in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and uh, to the rest of the audience. Uh, Alhamdulillah, again, we have a session, another session with Dr. Reza Shah Kazemi uh, for the reading of the, the Book of Certainty. Uh, but however, uh, in the previous session, he has referred to the notes in the book uh, which is uh, referring to a book by uh, uh, which is relevant uh, for our discussion, which is a book by uh, Rene Genon, the, 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 the Three Triads. Yeah? Uh, I think without further ado, I can give the floor to uh, Dr. Reza Shah Kazemi. Please. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Khalid. Um, yes, um, the, the notes we had last time at the end of chapter two was note number 20. And it says it's to do with the difference between the eye of certainty and the truth of certainty. Ayn al yaqeen and haqq al yaqeen. And uh, just to remind people that may not have been listening to the earlier sessions, uh, Dr. Lings has explained that the, the attainment of that degree of realization designated by the term eye of certainty, Ain al Yaqeen, which comes in the Quran in uh, the Surah At Takathur. Um, I forget the number of that, it's one of the, the shortest surahs uh, in the Quran. And it says, if only you could see what was coming, if only you could see it with Ain al Yaqeen with the eye of certainty. ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّ عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ لِعُمَّئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِينَ So this comes in a, in a chapter which is all about, in fact, this might not be a bad idea with your permission, Khalid. I'll just recapitulate <laughs> this, uh, how it comes, because this, the chapter is, it, it begins in a very challenging way. The eye of certainty uh, comes in this chapter, which is very challenging. Al Hakum at Takathur, seeking mutual, uh, seeking uh, plenty, plenitude, seeking more and more. Takathur, very difficult to translate into English. You're seeking of more and more profit in the world, worldly goods, worldly prosperity, your rivalry in seeking worldly goods. I think we have to use all those words for takathur. Al-hakum at takathur Your rivalry in seeking worldly goods, plenitude, abundance, has distracted you. Al-hakum at takathur Hatta zurtum al maqabir until you come to the graves. There are two meanings here. One is that uh, until, you know, you'll be distracted by worldliness until you finally die and you're in your grave and you think, what have I wasted my time doing in this world? The other is uh, also visiting the graves that until you actually dwell upon the reality of death. And this reminds one of what the, the prophet said, that you only need one preacher. Uh, and that preacher is death. Kafa bil mawti wa aizan. Death suffices as the only preacher you need. Just think about death and everything else will fall into place. Well, you'll come to know with sure knowledge, with the knowledge of, which is certain, with certain knowledge. The knowledge of that which is certainly going to happen. And that knowledge itself is infused with certainty. So this is ilm al the lowest degree. When you hear about, in Dr. Lings's terms, you, in terms of his image, you hear about the fire, but you haven't seen it yet. And it's interesting that in this surah, the ilm al is all about knowledge of death and what comes after death. And in this chapter, it's about the fire of hell that comes after those who have wasted their lives seeking worldly gain and being distracted from the truth, the reality of death. So 
You will come to know this with sure knowledge, with El Maliapi. Uh, and then you will come to, if only you could see this, with Ayn al Yaqeen, Thumma la Tarawunnaha Ayn al Yaqeen. Then you will see it, this day of judgment, this reality of hell. You'll see it with the eye of certainty. You will actually see the flames. Thumma la Tarawunna al Jaheem. Then you will see these flames of hell. Thumma, and then this incredible contrast that comes at the end of the chapter. Thumma la tus alunna yawma idhin anin na'im. Then you will be asked, what is pleasure? What is delight? What is happiness and bliss? Na'im. Very powerful rhetorical question at the end of this amazingly powerful short surah. You will then ask, what is it to be, is it to seek gain in the world that's going to be taken from you as soon as you die? Is that what pleasure is? So, in this short surah, we have the ilm al yaqeen the ayn al yaqeen You see the flames of hell and you also see, by implication, the bliss of paradise. Because those who have attained this degree of the eye of certainty are referred to uh, by Dr. Links and by Kashani and by the Sufi tradition generally as those people who have attained the degree of the fitra, of primordial perfection. They have, they have become one with the essence of al-insan. Uh, and insan is the eye, the pupil of the eye. That's another meaning of the word insan. Um, which is the pupil of the eye that, that sees. And Ibn Arabi makes a great deal out of this, that the Ain, which is eye, is also the, the pupil, the dark point of the eye that actually sees. It's through this that you see, and it's through this that God sees his creation through the insan, through the pupil of the eye. Um, so the perfect man, al-insan al-kamil, contains these two degrees of certainty, as well as the lower one, of course, of all three degrees. But in terms of defining the soul of the perfect man, al-insan al-kamil, you have to see that as an individual, he has the eye of certainty, and as the haq, having realized the highest degree, which is the transcendent man, the, the ultimate perfection, to which not the human being, but the consciousness of the human being within the heart has access, that is defined in terms of haq al yaqeen That is when the individual has been burnt, consumed entirely in the fire of reality, divine reality. So that what subsists is therefore beyond all, all language, all thought, all conception. And it's there that you have this leap. It's a kind of, we have to make a, a paradigm shift from the eye of certainty to the truth of certainty. The Ayn al yaqeen to the Haq al yaqeen It's a paradigm shift because you can no longer really talk in terms of the individuality subsisting. Last week, uh, Khalid, we had gone through chapter two where Kashani had spoken about how the date and the pomegranate represent the two degrees of realization within the two higher gardens. And that the date is the garden of the spirit where they have where duality subsists. You still talk about the individuality of the saints and the prophets. Uh, and you have the fruit and the stone. But in the pomegranate, you have no duality. You have just undifferentiated unity, all the possibilities of the divine uh, treasure that is hidden and loves to be known. All of those jewels are like the little seeds that are themselves fruits within the one fruit, which is the pomegranate. So this is the perfect symbol for the Jannat of that, for the garden mm. of the essence. There's no more individuality. And this also Shuan has very beautifully expressed in terms of the orthodox Christian image of the saved, the beatified, um, 
the, the saved souls in paradise who have crowns of uncreated light. So they are individually there in paradise enjoy, enjoying the beatific vision. And that beatific vision that directly identifies each one of the saved blessed souls with the one and only reality of the Father is uh, symbolized by crowns of uncreated light. Uh, and that is the relationship between the individuals in the garden of the spirit and the total absence of individuality in the absolute unity of the garden of the essence. So we have these two degrees, the individual, the attainment of perfection, which is primordial perfection, which is the fitra, which is the hapipa of insaniya. That is the eye of certainty. And then above and beyond that, in an incommunicable, indescribable way, you have this thing that we, that uh, Lings are saying that Genon has described in terms of the distinction between the true man and the transcendent man. So in order to, and I'll just read what, uh, as I've already read that, that the difference between the eye of certainty and the truth of certainty corresponds exactly to the distinction made by the Taoists between the degrees of true man and transcendent man. So I thought we would, we should read, I, it's, it's four pages, so I'll just read the, the two pages that really are crucial to uh, understanding this distinction in Taoism between true man and transcendent man, and this will cast light on, our, our, on the book of certainty that we're reading right now. So, um, Genon says, this is on page 126 of the Great Triad, that uh, this correspondence between lesser and greater mysteries. Remember, Dr. Ling's also said that the uh, eye of certainty corresponds to the lesser mysteries, the perfection of the human state, and the truth of certainty, haq al yaqeen, corresponds to greater mysteries that come only after death, as it were. Uh, and that's why in the Shakespearean tragedies, uh, as Dr. Lins has explained, so what cr such crystalline clarity that the greater mysteries begin only at the end of these great tragedies when death has been achieved by the heroes and the heroines. So we have this distinction, and Genon is saying that there is a correspondence between the lesser and the greater mysteries, and this is a correspondence mirrored in hermetic symbolism, some symbolism of hermetic alchemy, by the analogy between the stages of whitening and reddening. Now, these are alchemical terms which are very interesting. We don't have time to go into that here. There is yet another factor involved. Stated simply, this is that the only point on the axis which is situated in the domain of the human state is the very center of that state. Consequently, the axis itself cannot be perceived directly by anyone who has not attained this center. It can only be perceived through the point, which is its trace on the plane representing that domain. Now, he puts trace in quotation marks because he's already referred to it earlier in the chapter where uh, he quotes from Chuang Su. Occupy Zhu. a man. Pardon? Chuang Zhu. Chuang Zhu. How, how do you pronounce it? Chuang Zhu. Chuang Zhu. Yes. Chuang Zhu says, Chapter 5 Occupying a man's body, he is no longer a man. What makes him still a man? is something infinitely small. And this is what Genon refers to as the trace. Mm. What makes him one with heaven is infinitely large. 
This is very, very important. Because what Zhang Shu, no, Zhang Shu, how is it? Correct. Zhang Shu, um, he's describing here, where is it? Footnote two. Yes, this is in where, where Geron is saying the transcendent man. And now I don't know how to pronounce this. Chun Zhen. Chun Zhen. Do you know? Chun Chun Jin, yes. Chun Jin. Uh, Chun Jin. And what about true man? Chen Jin. Chen Jin. Chen Jin. Chen Jin. Chen Jin. Yes. So, transcendent man, divine man, spiritual man, are alternative names for someone who has achieved total realization and has attained the supreme identity this is tawhid mm. in the absolute sense the true identity the making one identification make being one with the one strictly speaking he is no longer a man in an individual sense because he has risen above humanity and is totally liberated, not only from its specific conditions, but also from all other limiting conditions associated with manifested existence. And this is where Genon gives the footnote number two. This, this is now Zhang Zhe describing the transcendent man occupying a man's body he is no longer a man it's the first paradox it makes you think of zen how can you occupy the body of a man but you're no longer a man how is this possible like the sound of one hand clapping he is a man mm -hmm. but he's no longer a man He's merely wow. occupying the body of a man, but he has transcended the limiting conditions of humanity. How is this to be understood? What makes him still a man is something infinitely small. And what makes him one with heaven is infinitely large. I think that actually is, is all we need to do by way of reading about the difference between true man and transcendent man. I think this saying from Zhuang Zhu is sufficient. <laughs> so we won't read any more from that chapter. I'll just, uh, we can start with the reading from chapter three, unless there are any questions. All right, if there are no questions, then we can proceed. And actually, this is a very short chapter. So, Abdurrahman, if we could ask you to kindly read this chapter. It's just three, it's in fact two and a half pages. All right. Chapter three, the eye of certainty. And when we said unto the angels, make prostration before Adam, they prostrated themselves all save iblis and we said o adam dwell thou and thy wife in the paradise quran chapter 2 verse th verses 34 and 35 in all parts of the world but with many differences among different peoples as regards details tradition tells us of an age when men lived in a paradise on earth but although it is said that there were then no signs of corruption upon the face of the earth, upon the face of earth, it may be supposed, in view of the fall which followed, that during this age, the perfect human nature had become the basis for gradually less and less spiritual exaltation. This is inferred by some Sufi sheikhs from the story of Adam and Eve whose successive creations are said to be a, a sign or a presage 
from the very beginning of two different phases through which mankind in general was destined to pass during the Edenic age. The creation of Adam and his adoration by the angels is taken to refer to a period when man was born with consciousness of the self, that is, with the truth of certainty. The creation of Eve thus augurs a later period when man would be born in possession of the eye of certainty only, that is, in the state of merely human perfection. In the beginning, Eve was contained in Adam, as the human nature is contained in the divine. And her separate existence foreshadows the apparently separate existence of the perfect human nature as an entity in itself. Finally, the loss of this perfection corresponds to the loss of the Garden of Eden, which marks the end of the primordial age. This interpretation of the story of Adam and Eve makes it relevant to quote a saying attributed by some to the prophet. Before the Adam known to us, God created a hundred thousand Adams. Between the first Adam, to whom the angels prostrated themselves, and the Adam known to us, that is, the Adam who fell, lay the whole Edenic period. In fact, the changes which are said to have taken place in Adam could not have taken place in a single being. For the truth of certainty is, by definition, that which cannot be lost. It is, as we have already seen, for him who is veritably extinguished in it, eternity after extinction. In the truth of certainty, the eye of certainty is nothing at all. And yet for earthly darkness, it is said to be a light so splendid and satisfying that at first it might scarcely leave room for the conception of any brighter lights. This may be understood from the Quranic narrative of how God raised Abraham from one degree of certainty to another until he reached the truth. But we will mention this passage in more detail later, quoting here only so much as is relevant to what has just been said about the eye of certainty. And when he saw the moon uprising, he said, This is my Lord. Quran, chapter 6, verse 77. He alone whose heart is lit with this moon may be called the true man. For not only is it normal for man to possess the eye of certainty, but it may be said that this third eye is his most characteristic feature, whereby he is best to be distinguished from all other earthly creatures. If the earth be likened to a windowless house, then man is a washed tower in the house, and the eye of the heart is as a single window in that washed tower to which all the dwellers in the house look up for their light. Without this eye, man ceases to fulfill his essential function, having fallen from his true nature. But with this eye, he is the sole earthly receptacle of the spiritual light of which he is the dispenser among his fellow creatures. So that if he is not actually Lord of the universe, he is at least Lord of this state of existence. And though he does not possess the heavens, yet the heavens of themselves lean down to touch the earth in him, its highest point. His nature is thus made so majestic and holy that the titles of vice-regent, Khalifa, and Saint Wali, literally close friend of God, are given to him as well as to those above him. He also, like them, is a spiritual master who may guide others to his state of human perfection. And for himself to rise from this state and to pass through the heavens to extinction in the truth, he has no need of any outward master. For with the eye of certainty, he sees the path lying open before him along the ray of light which connects the moon of his heart with the sun of the spirit. This is the normal condition of man. Yeah, my goodness, that's... Oh, it, uh, I, I had completely forgotten just how, how poetic and powerful this, this chapter was. 
It really draws you up into a poetic vision of what it means to be a human being. And also it reminds me of what Ganon says in the Great Triad about the, the king Wang. Uh, is it Wang, Khalid? King? Wang. How do you pronounce it? Wang. Wang. Not Wang. 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 Yes. So the G is kind of swallowed up in the nun, the nation, the N. Wang. Wang. Yes. Wang. It, this reminds me of, of what Genon says about the king, the true pontiff, the, the bridge builder between heaven and earth. Um, and we also have a very important footnote, um, Abdul Rahman, which I think uh, we should read. Footnote 21 in my edition. Could we read that, please? Yes. Uh, note 21. This term, I think this refers to the... Uh, uh, the eye of the heart. The eye of the heart, yes. This term, which is here the equivalent of the eye of certainty, always denotes direct spiritual vision, but its meaning varies in respect of the intensity of that vision. For in the supreme paradise, the heart that is the center of being is no longer the moon, nor yet the sun. These are worn by the beloved as ornaments of silver and gold. Their spiritual possibilities are also represented by the green silk ropes and by the immortal youths which go around about them, whereas the heart is the essence itself. It was evidently according to this higher sense that the Sufi Al-Hallaj said, I saw my Lord with the eye of the heart. I said, Who art thou? He answered, Thou. Mm. Ra'aytu Rabbi bi'ayni qalbi, is it uh, Abdu? Is it bi'ayni qalbi or ayn al-qalb? Ayn al-qalbi. Bi'ayn al-qalbi. So, Abdu, can you do it again? Ra'aytu Rabbi bi'ayni qalbi, fakultu man ant, qala ant. Yes. Yeah, that, that. The, uh, the heart, it was evidently according to this highest sense that the Sufi Halaj said this. So, yes, another interesting thing I noticed here is the because Abdu and I are, are working on the Green Knight multimedia uh, website, and uh, we're thinking about the symbolism of the color green. Can anyone tell me? what the significance is in this footnote of Dr. Ling saying that the uh, that the heart, the center of the being, is no longer the sun nor yet the moon. These, namely the moon and the sun, are worn by the beloved as ornaments of silver and gold. So the moon, ornaments of silver. Sun, ornaments of gold that are worn by the beloved. Their spiritual possibilities are also represented by the green silk robes and by the immortal youths which go round about them, whereas the heart is the essence itself. So what's the significance of the green color of the silk robes? Can anyone help me with this? What Dr. Ling seems to be saying here in talking about the green silk robes and by the immortal youths is that the color green is the color of immortality. The, the color green of Al-Khidr, Al-Khadr, is the color of immortality, and, the, and Moses is looking for the waters of immortality, the Majma al Bahrain, the elixir, which is found at the junction of the, the two waters, where heaven and earth come together and where the earthly becomes absorbed into the heavenly. So that the Al Khidr is found at the point of, of the, uh, the center of the human state where the axis arises that we were talking about with Genon, the axis that links earth to heaven, 
can only be attained from the center of the human state. And so that center of the human state is like a barzai between the earthly and the heavenly. It's the pontifex that links the two degrees of reality. It's immortality, and it's symbolized by the color green, al khidr and therefore the color of these silk robes in paradise is likewise green, which signifies immortality, eternal, perennial life, that the color green in nature pertains to perennials that never die, they, they, they carry on, as it were, symbolically going through the four seasons, they're always green. So maybe this is what Dr. Lings is getting at. Is it, can, I, can I just um, maybe yeah. add a note? Is it also, could we also be related to Ibn Arabi when he talks about his initiation um, uh, from Al Khidr, that when he said, Labastu Al Khirqat Al Khadra, I worn the, the, the green garment, which was a sign of initiation uh, oh. from Sayyidna, from Al Khidr. Was that when he said the green robes? So I wonder if there is a link mm. there. Definitely, I'd had, I completely, if I ever knew it, I completely forgot. Well, I was just noticing now when he, when uh, Dr. Ling said green robes or the green mm. silk robes, I wonder if there is a link there. Mm. I'm sure there is. I'm sure it's not coincidence that, mm. uh, and also it's, it's very interesting that the Quran doesn't actually name Al Khidr as the green one. And it's only through the prophetic sayings that we have this. Uh, it's almost as if the mystery of the connection between this man who represents, and let's remember what the Quran says in the Surah al kaf I'm sure that Dr. Lings goes into this as well later in the book, that, that uh, the only kind of being, the human being, that could teach Moses, the great lawgiver, the great prophet, the great Rasul, the only kind of being that could teach the prophet Moses the mysteries of existence that go beyond the Sharia, that go, be, go beyond causality, rationality, conventionality, uh, to go into the mystery of things. This person could only be a symbol, a personification of what Dr. Lings is talking about, the transcendent man. Moses represents the true man. He's attained the fullness of human possibilities in the story, in the narrative of the cave. Whereas Al Khidr is the one who has been given Rahmata min indina wa ilman min lad. How is it? Abda min ibadina atayna hu Rahmata min indina wa illa min ladunna. So. He's been given a knowledge yeah, from well, our very... وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا So it's the, the yeah. ladun ilm as it's, it's called. Right. Mm. So mm. This, pre this knowledge that's come from the presence of God and the rahmah that's come from عِنْدَ Allah is obviously of a transcendent degree vis-à-vis -vis the rahmah and the knowledge that was given to Moses. So this being can be a symbol of the transcendent man, the greater mysteries. And Moses is the symbol of the human being in all his fullness, the fitra, the lesser mysteries, the true man. So yeah, I think that's very helpful that when Ibn Arabi talks about this khirqa, which is green, and also as I say that the Quran doesn't say that this person is al khidr it just says he's a slave from amongst our slaves, and it's the prophet who tells us. So it's as, almost as if the mystery of this, of what uh, of Chuang Tzu said, that he occupies the body of a man, but he is no longer a man. So it's, it's a beautiful expression of the, the transcendence of the degree of knowledge attained by this being, even though that being is outwardly and apparently occupying the body of a man. So what I'd like to do uh, uh, is before we open up for questions is just to read again from page 18 to 19, this last beautiful paragraph. 
He alone, whose heart is lit with this moon, may be called the true man. For not only is it normal for man to possess the eye of certainty, but it may be said that this third eye is his most characteristic feature, whereby he is best to be distinguished from all other earthly creatures. If the earth be likened to a window, this is where the poetry becomes, the poetic imagery becomes very, very powerful. If the earth be likened to a windowless house, then man is a watchtower in the house. And the eye of the heart is as a single window in that watchtower, through which all the dwellers in the house look up for their light. Without this eye, man ceases to fulfill his essential function, having fallen from his true nature. But with this eye, he is the sole earthly receptacle of the spiritual light of which he is the dispenser among his fellow creatures. So that if he is not actually Lord of the universe, he is at least Lord of this state of existence. And though he does not possess the heavens, yet the heavens of themselves lean down to touch the earth in him, its highest point. His nature is thus made so majestic and holy that the titles of vice regent, Khalifa, and Saint Wali, literally close friend of God, are given to him as well as to those above him. He also, like them, is a spiritual master who may guide others to his state of human perfection and for himself to rise from this state and to pass through the heavens to extinction in the truth, he has no need of any outward master. For with the eye of certainty, he sees the path lying open before him along the ray of light, which connects the moon of his heart with the sun of the spirit. This is the normal condition of man. I think that's a, a beautiful description by Dr. Ling's of himself. And this is what makes the reading of this book of certainty so much more of an experiential, visceral taste of the doctrine of certainty. That it's come from the hands, the hand, the pen of a man who was writing about these realities, such as he has himself assimilated them, become one with them, so that when he says this is the normal condition of the human being, he can only say that with such certainty, because he himself had become the book of certainty. I would dare to say that he had become virtually a spiritual master, even when he wrote this book in the early 1950s. And that out of modesty, he would never have accepted if someone had said to him, uh, yeah, Sidi Abu Bakr, you're writing about yourself when you talk about one who has attained human perfection and who knows what it is to transcend that. Even if you have not yet done that yourself, you see exactly what you're describing here at the end of this chapter, that you see, he sees the path with the eye of certainty he sees the path lying open before him along the ray of light which connects the moon of his heart with the sun of the spirit. This is the normal condition of man. It's as if he's describing himself. And as I say, this is why this book has had such an extraordinary impact. As many of you know, it was this book more than any other that brought the great Sheikh Hamza Yusuf to Islam as he himself. Uh, confessed in a, a gathering uh, on she uh, to commemorate Dr. Ling's. In fact, no, it was it was in the presence of, of Dr. Ling's. It was before he died, and it was at the Globe Theatre in she in uh, London. Um, and uh, Sheikh Hamza said that this man, Martin Ling's Abu Bakr Sirajuddin, his name means 
the lamp of religion. And he truly was that for me, because when I was an 18 year old looking for a religion after my near death experience, and I came across this as the only book on Islam that said anything to me about the religion, it was this book more than any other that helped me to enter the religion of Islam. Now, why is that the case? I mean, what kind of baraka has God put that through this book, so massively influential a Muslim in our time, a Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, at, in who, at whose hands, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of people have come to faith in God through his hands, through entering Islam, or if not entering Islam, having their own faith in their own religion reinforced, as was the case with his own father. So you look at the massive influence of one human being, Hamza Yusuf, setting up the Zaytuna Institute, um, the first properly accredited Muslim university in the United States. How much good has come from that one man and how that has come in turn through the grace that God gave him by means of this wasila, this vehicle, this means of the book of certainty. And so I would say that the barakah, the blessings that come from this book, uh, similar to what happens when you read Dr. Ling's biography of Muhammad, you feel the presence of the Prophet Muhammad coming through the book. When you read the book of certainty, you feel something of that certainty of the writer of this book coming through into your heart. So it reinforces your certainty. So. I'm going to finish there, and we can open up to any questions that may arise. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reza. Uh, unfortunately, now we have uh, run into Maghrib time in Malaysia. Right. Mm, so I think we have to uh, postpone the question, question answer session uh, two weeks from now. What I suggest for next time is that uh, we can start with the Q&A next time right. at the beginning and we look a little bit more carefully at um uh well no we'll just start with the q a but i would like to, to have a one or two questions on the significance of the color green in these right. verses uh pertaining to paradise inshallah thank you very inshallah. much dr reza right. thank you and